from New York and Glasgow, this is Democracy Now! My fellow Virginians, this is our moment. In a shocker for Democrats, Republican Glenn Youngkin has won the Virginia gubernatorial race, while the New Jersey governor's race is too close to call. We'll get the latest. Then we go to the UN Climate Summit in Glasgow to look at the fight against big coal from South Africa to Puerto Rico with Kumi Naidu and Ruth Santiago. We're not only denouncing and resisting this fossil fuel system, we are saying, look, let's go to the alternatives. Plus, we speak to the leading Filipina youth climate activist, Mitzi Tan. The Philippines is one of the most climate vulnerable countries in the world to the climate crisis, and Standard Chartered Bank is fueling most of that destruction in our country. They are the biggest international bank that is funding the most fossil fuel companies in my country, the Philippines, which is ravaged by typhoons year after year. They've brought destruction to our doorstep, so we're here at their doorstep to demand for justice and to demand them to defund climate chaos. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In U.S. election news, Republican Glenn Youngkin has defeated Democrat and former Governor Terry McAuliffe in Virginia's closely watched gubernatorial election, which was considered a bellwether for next year's midterms. The win comes one year after Virginians voted for President Biden over Trump by a margin of 10 percent. Youngkin, a former CEO of the Carlisle Group private equity firm, said he would support reinstating some abortion restrictions in Virginia, opposes teaching critical race theory in schools, and has opposed school mask and COVID vaccine mandates. Republicans have also flipped several seats in Virginia's House of Delegates and could retake control of the chamber, though final results have not yet been called. New Jersey's gubernatorial race remains too close to call, with Republican Jack Cittarelli leading incumbent Democrat Phil Murphy by mm, around 1,000 votes, with 88 percent of ballots counted. But at this point, the heavily Democratic areas of Trenton and Jersey City and Newark and Princeton have not been counted. In another hotly anticipated race, community leader and socialist candidate India Walton is trailing four term incumbent Byron Brown for mayor of Buffalo, New York. Walton beat Brown in the Democratic primary, but he responded by launching a write-in campaign in the general election. In New York City, Brooklyn Borough President, former police captain, Democrat Eric Adams, has become the city's second black mayor. During his campaign, he vowed to tackle crime while focusing on racial justice. Meanwhile, Pittsburgh has elected its first black mayor, Democrat Ed Ganey. In Massachusetts, 36-year-old Democrat Michelle Wu has become the first woman, first Asian American and first person of color to be elected mayor of Boston. Wu, whose family immigrated to the United States from Taiwan, served as a Boston city councilor and is close to Senator Elizabeth Warren, who was her professor at Harvard Law School. She played to fight against racial inequality, gentrification, and to make transportation and housing more accessible to lower-income residents. Two U.S. House seats were up for grabs in special elections in Ohio. In the 15th congressional district, Trump endorsed Republican Mike Carey beat Democrat Allison Russo, who was endorsed by President Biden. Meanwhile, Democrat Chantel Brown beat Republican Laverne Gore to take the 11th district seat, left vacant by Marsha Fudge when she became the secretary of housing and urban development. In Minneapolis, Mayor Jacob Frey is the lead after is in the lead after the first round of Minneapolis ranked choice vote. Minneapolis voters rejected a measure to replace the police with the Department of Public Safety. Meanwhile, in Austin, Texas voters have overwhelmingly rejected a referendum to require the hiring of more police officers. 
Oregon is poised to become the first state to legalize the active ingredient in magic mushrooms for medical use, an Oregon ballot measure to decriminalize the possession of small quantities of some hard drugs, including heroin and LSD, is also on track to be approved. Voters in the District of Columbia have voted in favor of decriminalizing the use of so-called magic mushrooms and other psychedelic substances. We'll have more on the elections after headlines with John Nichols. President Biden and other world leaders have departed Glasgow and the U.N. climate summit as day three ushers in closed-door negotiations on how to combat the climate catastrophe. On Tuesday, 90 countries agreed to slash methane emissions by 30 percent by 2030. This is President Biden announcing the U.S. commitments. We're proposing two new rules. One through our Environmental Protection Agency that's going to reduce methane losses from new and existing oil and gas pipelines. And one through the Department of Transportation to reduce wasteful and potential dangerous leaks from natural gas pipelines. A climate activist slammed Biden for making climate pledges while his administration continues to advance plans to sell oil and gas leases on U.S. public lands. Meanwhile, indigenous leaders questioned commitments from over 100 countries to end deforestation by 2030. This is Telma Tarapang, who leads the Union of Indigenous Women of the Brazilian Amazon. We don't have yet a public policy towards the indigenous peoples in Brazil that makes sure it happens for real. And they will only for certain stop deforestation if there is the demarcation of our indigenous lands. Without demarcation, there's no way to stop deforestation. In other news from COP26, the U.S., the European Union and other wealthy nations have announced a new deal to provide $8.5 billion to South Africa to help it decommission its coal plants and invest in renewable energy. South Africa is one of the largest coal producers in the world. We'll go to Glasgow for the latest from the Climate Summit later in the broadcast and speak with Kumi Naidu, who is from South Africa. The Centers for Disease Control have backed the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine for children age 5 to 11, opening up the two-dose shot to an additional 28 million kids who will receive one-third of the dosage of people 12 and older. The Ethiopian government has declared a six-month nationwide state of emergency, as it says it's preparing to defend the capital, Addis Ababa, from Tigrayan rebel forces that threaten the city would be overrun within, quote, months, if not weeks. The state of emergency allows the government to impose curfews and roadblocks and for the Ethiopian military to take over certain areas of the country. The government's also called on citizens to take up arms against rebel fighters. This comes as the U.N. has condemned human rights atrocities uncovered by a joint investigation into the war in the Tigray region. The U.N. said all parties involved in the conflict, including forces from Eritrea, have committed violations of international human rights, some of which could amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity. This includes extrajudicial killings, torture, sexual and gender-based violence. The U.N. also accused Ethiopia's government of attempting to limit the investigation. In occupied East Jerusalem, four families from the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood officially rejected a deal from the Israeli Supreme Court that would delay their eviction but force them to cede ownership of their houses and pay rent to Israeli settlers who claimed the homes as theirs. This is activist and affected Sheikh Jarrah resident Moon El Kurd. We reject because we believe in our cause and our right to our home and country, despite that we are not getting any guarantees to support our steadfastness as Palestinians in the occupied Jerusalem from any side or organization. Following the rejection of the deal, the Israeli Supreme Court could order the families be evicted within weeks. In May, the planned expulsions helped spark the latest war in Gaza and galvanized international support for Palestinians facing dispossession from settler groups and the state of Israel. Facebook announced it's shutting down its facial recognition system and deleting face scan templates of over a billion people by December. Facebook will not, however, get rid of the algorithm which powered the facial recognition technology called DeepFace. It also did not rule out using such technology in the future. The move comes amidst mounting scandals for Facebook, which recently changed its corporate name to Meta. The ACLU welcomed the move, calling it a good start, adding, quote, now it's time 
time for enforceable rules that prohibit companies from scanning our faces without our consent. Looking at you, Congress, ACLU said. Democrats said they reached a deal to help rein in prescription drug costs as part of the Build Back Better Act. The provision would allow the government to negotiate prices for Medicare prescriptions for the first time. But drug companies would have patent exclusivity for 9 to 12 years before the government could begin those negotiations. The legislation would also ban pharmaceutical companies from raising prices quicker than inflation and cap out-of-pocket expenses for seniors on Medicare at $2,000 per year. This is Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer announcing the deal Tuesday. Fixing prescription drug pricing has consistently been a top issue for Americans year after year, including the vast majority of both Democrats and Republicans who want to see a change because they simply cannot afford their medications. In a long-fought victory for LGBTQ plus rights, same-sex partners will have access to survivors' benefits if their partners die before they were able to legally marry or they did not meet a threshold of being married at least nine months. On Monday, the Justice Department and the Social Security Administration dropped two Trump administration challenges to lawsuits that granted same-sex couples in both those categories the right to Social Security survivors' benefits. A counsel at Lambda Legal, which brought the lawsuit suit celebrated the news, saying, quote, no one should continue to pay the price for past discrimination. And over 10,000 John Deere workers will remain on strike after a majority last night voted to reject the latest contract proposal negotiated by their union. Workers are fighting for better wages and pension plans. They've been on strike for nearly a month. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, in a blow to Democrats, Republicans have won the governor's race in Virginia with the wealthy private e equity executive Glenn Youngkin defeating former Governor Terry McAuliffe. Youngkin campaigned in part by vowing to support so-called parents' rights, which has become a catch-all phrase to describe right-wing opposition to vaccine and mask mandates, trans rights for students and the teaching of critical race theory. Youngkin spoke at a victory party in Chen Tilly, Virginia. My fellow Virginians, this is our moment. It's our moment for parents, for grandparents, for aunts, for uncles, for neighbors to change the future of Virginia's children's lives, to change their Virginia journey. It's our time to turn that vision into a reality. Meanwhile, in New Jersey, the governor's race is too close to call, as Republican Jack Cittarelli has a slight lead over incumbent Democrat Philip Murphy. To talk about the governor's races, we're joined by John Nichols. He's the nation's national affairs correspondent, author of a number of books, including The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party. So let's start in Virginia, John talk about the significance of the Republican victory for governor, about Youngkin's campaign. And then we'll move to New Jersey, where it's clearly too close to call. The main Democratic strongholds have not been counted yet. That's precisely right, Amy, and thanks for having me. Uh, let's start in Virginia. And I think that, that the first thing to point out is, of course, this is an off-year election. Uh, in which uh, there's clearly an overlay from what's going on in Washington and Virginia, Northern Virginia in particular, is suburban Washington. So there's a lot of consciousness about uh, where the Biden administration is at and things of that nature. But once we put that, you know, in its place, then I think it's important to understand what happened in Virginia. And that is that Virginia Democrats chose to nominate what they thought was a very safe candidate, Terry McAuliffe, the former governor. Uh, he beat a number of other candidates in the Democratic primary, uh, with most of the Democratic leadership saying, well, this is the easiest way to retain the governorship. But McAuliffe ran uh, what can best be understood as an unfocused and bumbling campaign in, in, many, in many instances. On the other hand, Republicans nominated a, a candidate who was untested, uh, Glenn Youngkin, but who was very sophisticated, very disciplined in his approach. 
And what he did was at once embrace Donald Trump's constituency. I mean, actually, you know, clearly accept Trump's support and clearly, uh, you know, communicate that, that he was on board with a lot of where Trump was at. But at the same time, in his overall messaging, uh, seek to, to uh, identify himself with just enough distance that he could appeal to folks who don't necessarily like Donald Trump. Now, it's notable in the exit polls, he got almost one in five of his votes from people who said they don't approve of Trump. So he was getting people who had undoubtedly voted for Joe Biden in 2020 to come over. How did he do that? He did it with a combination of sort of soft messaging about uh, his actually very right-wing uh, proposals and very right-wing stands on the issues, and a dog-whistling uh, use of the issue of critical race theory that the Republicans have developed. And this is obviously uh, a, an effort to suggest that parents should be far more in control of curriculums in schools, and frankly, uh, that they should be able to dictate a curriculum that doesn't acknowledge much of the history of the United States, or at least soft pedals it. And Yonkin did that in very sophisticated ways. There is simply no question that what he did in Virginia will become a template for Republicans in other states. But there's also one counsel. While there's a lot of focus on critical race theory and how it was played in Virginia, in school board races around the country, including one in my own state of Wisconsin, where school boards were threatened with recall uh, on critical race issues and on, on all this, uh, in many cases, the school board members won their, won their fights. They, they weren't recalled. And one of the reasons for that is that in, for instance, the Wisconsin case, they directly confronted the issue. They, they said, you know, look, this is, this is a Republican political strategy. It is a, an attempt to dog whistle and to exploit. In Virginia, uh, I think the message from the Democrats was, on that was quite muddled in many cases. They did try to confront it in some ways, but uh, I don't think that they, they did very well. End of the day, uh, if I had to divide up what the impacts were on Virginia, I would say that uh, the quality, the character of the Yunkin campaign did benefit, but also the biggest influence there, in my opinion, is the fact that the Democrats in Washington have seemed extremely chaotic, even dysfunctional in recent months. And the truth is, they control the White House and the Congress, and you can't fail to deliver on your promises and then expect to win elections. And that's a big message for Democrats. Uh, but John, I wanted to ask you, putting Virginia in context with New Jersey as well, because I, I think it's likely that uh, Phil Murphy is going to win the New Jersey race, even though he's slightly behind right now, only because, uh, as uh, Amy mentioned, a lot of the Democratic strongholds, including Camden, which is uh, had the lowest uh, uh, returns uh, so far, are likely to push him over. Nonetheless, he was expected to win by much more uh, than uh, if he does uh, become the victor. So it does seem to me that at least in these races where you essentially had corporate Democrats in both Phil Murphy uh, and Terry McAuliffe uh, at uh, running, that the ability, their ability to make the race uh, against Trump <laughs> uh, rather mm -hmm. than for themselves, uh, like, suffered greatly. And I'm wondering your sense of, uh, given the fact that the right-wing populism of Trump is still uh, uh, surging in a lot of parts of the country, what this, what this means for, um, uh, for elections next year. I think it means a lot, and I think your analysis is very strong. Uh, my sense is that Murphy will win in New Jersey, and I think it's important to, to note that Murphy ran a much more focused campaign, and frankly, a more progressive campaign on, on message, and, and frankly, on some of his record, than you had from McAuliffe. Uh, ultimately, I, I think Murphy's probably going to win by a reasonably comfortable margin, not a big, big landslide or anything like that, but reasonably comfortable when all the votes are counted. But still, it's much closer than it should be uh, by, by any reasonable measure. And then I'd also throw in the Pennsylvania Supreme Court race, a, a statewide race in a battleground state where the Republican appears to have prevailed. And so what you see from a number of states where you've got statewide races where they really are tests of kind of where people are going to vote and, and you know, kind of where the pattern is, in each case, the Republicans prevailed. I think that, uh, again, there's two things in play here. 
Number one, what you point out, the Democratic Party continues, and they especially did this in Virginia, they continue to reject uh, candidates of the future. Uh, and these are women, people of color, uh, progressives in favor of candidates of the past, candidates who often are, have held office before or are holding office and are very, very predictable. And at, at this moment, at this volatile moment, that doesn't work very well. Secondly, however, uh, you do have this national overlay, and I think it's a big deal. Uh, the Democrats have, since midsummer, uh, sent a signal of, yeah, we've got lots of big plans, we've got lots of big goals, we control the presidency, we control the House and the Senate, but we're not delivering. We can't get it together. We can't even get our own, our own people together. And it's very easy to blame Joe Manchin and to blame Kirsten Sinema, and they deserve a lot of blame on this. But there also has to be a recognition that the Biden administration, Democratic leaders in Congress, did not follow the advice of Senator Bernie Sanders, the Senate uh, Budget Committee chair, and of Congressional Progressive Caucus chair Pramila Jayapal, who said, look, you need to go out and sell this program. You need to talk about it in big, bold ways across the country so people really know everything that's in this Build Back Better agenda and they know what's at stake. They didn't do that. They relied on kind of insider, predictable, uh, backdoor, behind-the-scenes negotiations. And, and it didn't work. President Biden flew off to Europe uh, with a framework that Joe Manchin didn't support. And so at the end of the day, Democrats are in a situation where they promised a lot, but they have not delivered. And you cannot fail to deliver and expect to win elections. We're going to turn to some of the mayoral races, uh, several closely watched ones. In Buffalo, Mayor Byron B Brown has claimed Victorina's write-in campaign against India Walton, who shocked Brown in June by winning the Democratic primary. She was attempting to become the first socialist to lead a big city in decades. Here in New York City, and I want Juan to also weigh in on this, Eric Adams easily won the mayoral race, becoming just the second African-American to head the nation's largest city. In Minneapolis, uh, Mayor Jacob Fry is the in the lead after the first round of the city's ranked choice vote. And in Boston, Michelle Wu has made history by becoming the first woman, the first person of color, elected as mayor. She spoke Tuesday night. We are ready to become a Boston for everyone. We're ready to be a Boston that doesn't push people out but welcomes all who call our city home. We're ready to be a Boston where all can afford to stay and to thrive. And yes, Boston is ready to become a Green New Deal city. A Green New Deal city, says the new mayor-elect of Boston, Michelle Wu, a protege of Massachusetts Senator uh, um, Elizabeth Warren, John Nichols, the mayoral races around the country. Well, I'm glad you uh, focused on Michelle Wu there. I think her victory is uh, incredibly instructive, uh, and it hasn't been covered enough uh, by much of the national media. Michelle Wu ran as a progressive. She started early. She built a grassroots, multiracial, multiethnic coalition. She focused on big issues with big messages, and she won big. Uh, she did very well in the primary, uh, in the general election prevailed. Uh, I think there's a lot of, of lessons there as regards our politics, because remember, Boston is not uh, a city that, that you know, has had a lot of diversity in its mayors. They tended to be Irish or Italian, uh, you know from Irish and Italian backgrounds uh, for generations. And also, it's a city with uh, some pretty tough, very competitive politics. And so there you see a Elizabeth Warren progressive prevail, talking about the Green New Deal, talking about economic and social and racial justice, talking about affordable housing. So it's doable. And I think that's an important message. Uh, in the mayoral races in general, uh, Democrats prevailed, but you saw very different types of Democrats prevail, very different messages. Uh, some like Michelle Wu, very progressive. Some like Eric Adams in New York, who have been very critical, at least of, of Democratic socialists. And then up in Buffalo, you have this situation where, uh, and it's, it's really a, a, a notable situation in Buffalo, where India Walton won her primary, fair and square. Uh, she built a grassroots campaign. She didn't have a lot of money, but she had a lot of message. She's very, very engaged with housing issues and a lot of issues that are vital to Buffalo. Uh, she got the nomination, and then uh, two things happened. Number one, 
the leadership of the state Democratic Party in New York, including the chair of the state Democratic Committee, uh, Governor Hochul, and others failed to endorse her. They failed to come in and, and give her strong backing. Uh, secondly, a lot of very, very wealthy and powerful interests uh, in Buffalo and outside of Buffalo poured money into Byron Brown's campaign. He raised more than $1.5 million. We don't know what the final total will be. Flooded the TV uh, airwaves with ads that uh, were, you know, obviously very supportive of him, but also a lot of messaging that was very negative about India Walton. And, and you really see a situation here where the, somebody won the Democratic nomination but didn't get uh, the level of support from the Democratic Party that, that might have allowed her to prevail. Juan, I wanted to ask you, before we move on, about Eric Adams, someone you have covered for years, police captain, uh, um, Brooklyn borough president, a state legislator, and um, now he has become the second African-American uh, who will become mayor of New York. Uh, talked about being learning disabled, wept when he went to the polls yesterday, holding his mother's picture, who just died, was beaten by police and arrested as a young person took on the New York Police Department, the significance of his win, though against the defund movement? Uh, well, uh, I think, as I said before, I've known Eric Adams since he was just a police sergeant uh, more than 30 years ago and, and worked with him closely over the years as, as a reporter. Uh, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, the, his victory, and I'd like to also toss this to John Nichols in terms of what's happened with India Walton and Minneapolis, uh, what happened with the Minneapolis police uh, referendum as well, seems to indicate that uh, a lot of African-American and Latino voters are not as uh, in sync with the, uh, the, uh, the progressive left. Uh, on issues of police reform. And I think that uh, uh, the uh, because the African-American and Latino vote is such a big portion of the Democratic Party, I think that folks are going to have to come to some uh, realization of what is possible within a capitalist system and, and within a situation where uh, corporate Democrats also uh, wield an enormous uh, influence and finances in terms of elections. And I'm wondering, John, whether it you see that, with the exception of Michelle Wu, a lot of the results uh, this time around were not only a rebuke of the um, uh, the more corporate Democrats, but also, uh, to some degree, a rebuke of the more uh, left-wing proposals of, pro of progressives as well. Well, you saw a direct test in uh, Minneapolis, where a, a proposal to really change the, the policing structure in that city from uh, a very more traditional one with, frankly, a, a police force very influenced by a very right-wing union uh, to a public safety model. And that lost. Uh, it didn't lose by a massive landslide, but it, it did lose. Uh, and so at the end of the day, uh, I think that there is evidence that, uh, that there's resistance here. But I would emphasize, and I think this is important to recognize, that uh, if you look at, at all of these races, you see an acknowledgment of a need to change policing. It is a debate about how to do so and about how to message that. But uh, I would be careful about saying that, that you know, there's a, a full-on rejection of uh, some of the, the left's messages about the need for a change in policing. I, I think there is still a constituency for that and a base for that. It just, I do think that there's going to be some wrestling with it. And uh, Democrats, frankly, are going to have to figure out how to talk about the need to change policing in a way that can build out confidence and build out constituencies. I will note also— We have 15 I think seconds. A, it's just important to note that in New York City, while Eric Adams won big, and, and for a variety of reasons, uh, that Jumani Williams and Brad Lander, both very, very progressive candidates, won the other two citywide races by equally large margins. And so uh, I think that, that we, can take, we can take many signals from this election. And I do think we should pay attention uh, not just to uh, the top-level wins, but some of those wins down ballot as well. We want to thank you for being with us, John Nichols, Nation's national affairs correspondent, author of a number of books, including The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party. Next up, we go to Glasgow to the U.N. summit to look at the fight against big coal from South Africa to Puerto Rico with Kumi Naidu and Ruth Santiago and leading Filipino youth climate activist Mitzi Tan. Stay with us. Back in 30 seconds.
Ease My Mind by the Pixies. This is Democracy Now!'s Climate Countdown. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. As we go to the UN Climate Summit in Glasgow, where 90 countries have agreed to slash methane emissions by 30 percent by 2030. Methane, one of the most potent greenhouse gases, the effort led by the United States and Europe. Climate groups praised the initiative, but said far more needs to be done to rapidly slash overall carbon emissions in order to avoid a climate catastrophe. In other news from Glasgow, the United States States, European Union and other wealthy nations have announced a new deal to provide $8.5 billion to South Africa to help it decommission its coal plants and invest in renewable energy. South Africa is one of the largest coal producers in the world. So we're going to begin there um, with one of leading South African climate activists, Kumi Naidu, former secretary general of Amnesty International and was previously the head of Greenpeace, now a global ambassador for Africans rising for justice, peace and dignity. Kumi, welcome back to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us as you stand there in Glasgow. Talk about this deal that was just made between the U.S., EU and South Africa and the significance of coal there and whether you see this as the beginning of a radical change in the world. This is a positive move in the right direction. The detail needs to be looked at more clearly. Uh, it's put pressure on the South African government, which had been dragging its feet to actually have a more aggressive timeline to actually get off coal. Um, the challenge is that about 100,000 people rely on coal mining jobs for their survival. But it's clear with these resources now, the South African government does not have an excuse to ensure that there is a just transition for workers in that various coal mining industries to be able to transition to clean energy jobs. Uh, of course, part of the package is to make sure that South Africa can increase its renewable energy output as soon as possible. Uh, just note, though, that there's an additional challenge, because South Africa relies for its electricity needs 80 percent on coal. And uh, with that 80 percent right now, for the last decade, there's been electricity cuts and so on. So there's a real possibility here for the South African government to move with urgency to transition in an aggressive way from coal to clean energy. And the options for South Africa, if it gets serious, are significantly positive. But the truth is, the government has dragged its foot for far too long, and we are playing catch up in South Africa as we are playing catch up everywhere in the world. And I think it's worth noting that the decade that we find ourselves in is the most consequential decade in humanity's history. What we achieve in the next 10 years will determine what kind of future we will have or whether we'll have a future at all. So the stakes are very high. The only cautionary point I would say in conclusion is that be careful about these grand announcements that are being uh, spliced in every other day. We need to make sure that we do the math at the end of it because we could have these grand announcements and they won't add up. And secondly, let's just be clear, rich countries, governments make announcements of financial support as they did for the 100 million pounds a year, uh, sorry, dollars a year for the Green Climate Fund by 2020, which they've not delivered. So let's see whether that money actually flows and we need to be vigilant to make sure that those nations actually follow through with that commitment. And Kumi, you mentioned that the South African government has been slow to make uh, to really address any transition away from coal. Uh, why is that? I mean, is it possible uh, because the the the, uh, the the mine workers or the coal miners are such a, a critical constituency of the ANC, or uh, is it just that the leaders have been in denial about uh, uh, the uh, the continuing uh, advance of the climate crisis? Well, I would say the first reason is the corruption chain, right, in terms of big fossil fuel projects is more juicier, more bulkier, more uh, lucrative. And it's not to say that renewable energy projects are immune from corruption, but actually they tend to be on a much lower scale and it's easier to monitor. And unfortunately, as is known uh, by the South African people and globally right now, we have a very corrupt leadership that's, in, that's been there, and the current leadership is trying to make things better. But the question of how decisions are made about what economic choices to make and about what spoils it would be is a reality. Uh, 
The second, and therefore it's very important that in the implementation of the deal, that there is consultation with faith leaders, with uh, civil society and so on, to make sure that those resources go to where they need to go. But it is true that the trade union movement, who are very open to a just transition, we in the environmental movement love the workers that work in our country. Right? We do not think they should be punished. It was not their fault that they were told that you need to deliver energy through a dirty means. Right? And therefore, we are saying with younger workers, younger workers can easily be retrained and uh, find jobs in the emerging renewable energy uh, sector. For older workers who are close to retirement, there needs to be proper compensation for them that they retire with dignity. And so I also think the other factor is that there's a denial. Just as there's a denial in virtually every country around the world where our political leaders say one thing, recognize the problem is serious, but revert to uh, business as usual. But this commitment, uh, this announcement does put pressure on the South African government to act with greater urgency, and it opens up possibilities also for civil society and uh, environmental activism in South Africa to say you don't have an excuse anymore to drag your feet. Of course, the unions are going to correctly want to see the finer print in what this deal is about, but I think given the scale of the money, we should be able to ensure a just transition and make the right investments in wind, solar, and other uh, clean energy technologies. Uh, yet, despite the uh, the climate crisis, uh, there's more uh, coal mines being opened up around the world uh, these days than, than ever. Could you, uh, uh, given that coal is the most polluting fossil fuel and many countries are heavily relying on it for electricity, how do you think a deal like this may have an impact in other countries, let's say like India or Indonesia or, or other nations around the world? We hope that this announcement will have a knock-on effect, particularly with the two countries you mentioned to start with, Indonesia, uh, India, Australia, and, and several others. We have to recognize that an investment of even $1 in any new coal project, based on what we know and how close we are to the climate cliff, must be understood as an investment in the death of our children and their children. So. Any investment in especially coal, but all fossil fuels right now, given what the science is saying, how little time we have, we are one minute before midnight, and so on, uh, must be understood as irresponsible, reckless, and is really a confirmation that the fossil fuel industry, those oil, coal, and gas companies, still exercise far too much of power on and control over many so-called elected governments in many parts of the world. Kumi Naidu, we want to thank you for being with us, but we want to have you back on before you leave. Global Ambassador for Africans Rising for Justice, Peace and Dignity, former Secretary General of Amnesty International, previously head of Greenpeace, uh, in uh, Glasgow right now, inside the COP, the Conference of Parties of the UN Climate Summit. But we're going to stick with this issue of coal and renewable energy. We're going to turn now to one of the places most affected by extreme weather over the past two decades in the world, and that is Puerto Rico. Hurricane Maria destroyed the island's electrical grid four years ago and left residents in the dark for months. Today, the fragile power system is still unreliable, prompting mass protests. Activists have also called on lawmakers to re-envision the island's energy grid with a focus on renewable energy. Some of its dirtiest power comes from Puerto Rico's largest fossil fuel burning power complex that includes the U.S.-owned AES coal plant known as La Cabanera. It is is in the rural municipality of Guayama, home to many of the island's Afro-Puerto Rican residents. They've long demanded the company stop dumping toxic coal ash and raise concerns about carbon emissions and water and air pollution. A new film, translated as The Power of the People, looks at how they're now organizing to expand rooftop solar energy projects. In a minute, we'll be joined by one of the residents who's featured in the film and is now in Glasgow. This is the trailer. 
When we had Hurricane Maria, some people had diesel or gas generators, and the cost of running them was exorbitant. And the noise and emissions from these generators made people sick. They were unbearable. You couldn't sleep. The solar panel don't make noise. And we can save money. We can use LED bulbs and other such things. not only denouncing and resisting this fossil fuel system, we are saying, look, let's go to the alternatives. What are the alternatives? Then more than anything else, our alternative is community organizing. Don Daniel, who is from El Coque community, he is an electrician and helps with that part. The youth help with their enthusiasm. When the solar system was installed in the community center, the youth did not want to come down from the roof. They spent an entire day there under the hot sun that we have in this country. They spent all day on the roof, looking, learning enthusiastically. We have so many roofs in this country. We collaborate on what we are able to do. And it's always been beneficial. Women, we are the strength in this effort. Yes, it is true. We are the ones who are there and we do not give up. We persevere until we achieve what we want. One of the people featured in El Poder del Pueblo, or The Power of the People, the person we just heard first in that clip was Ruth Santiago, who's joining us now from inside COP26 in Glasgow, in the UN Climate Summit, longtime lawyer, environmental justice advocate in Puerto Rico, member of the White House Environmental Justice Advocacy Council, who is attending COP26. It's great to have you with us, Ruth. If you can talk about, as we just listened to Kumi Naidu in South Africa and the amazing amazing way we can link globally to people dealing with the same critical issues, the climate catastrophe, and coal in particular, how it's affecting Puerto Rico and the privatization of the electrical grid. Sure. Thank you for having me. Uh, yes, absolutely. Coal is uh, a, a all over the world. It was uh, brought to Puerto Rico um, uh, by AES Corporation and that established a plant in November 2002. And it's had egregious uh, violations of um, environmental standards. Uh, and the, the AES coal plant has contaminated what is known as the, the South Coast Aquifer, the sole source of potable water for tens of thousands of people in southeastern Puerto Rico. Um, yeah, and then on top of that, we now have a crisis. Uh, it, people are calling it Hurricane Luma because the, this new joint venture company that took over the operation and management of the electric system in Puerto Rico, Luma Energy, created by um, Quanta Services and Adco Canadian Utilities, they are um, they don't have the workforce, they don't have the knowledge, and we're experiencing twice the number and frequency of outages than we did, say, for example, last year when the, we had the earthquakes and two of the big plants were out. And Ruth, could you talk a little bit more about uh, Luma and this privatization effort that occurred? Uh, and it's not the first time Puerto Rico has tried to privatize basic services. They did it decades ago with the, the, the water uh, and then had to go back to publicly owned water. Uh, th this company was created specifically just to to uh, to handle the this privatization effort or to bid on the privatization of Puerto Rico. How is it working so far in terms of electrical rates and in terms of the service that Luma's providing? Right. Um, so uh, the Luma contract is is the. Um, uh, most difficult problem we have right now with the electric system in terms of the fact that they don't know how to operate the system and we're having, as I mentioned, many outages more than last year, for example. Um, they were created, newly created, um, um, by these two big um, uh, uh, Quanta services and uh, Echo Canadian Utilities just for the purpose of operating um, the Puerto Rico grid and for um, the control um, and I've, in the contract, you can see how um, Luma Energy controls federal funding uh, for disaster recovery 
already allocated for the electric system. It's a historic amount that FEMA has allocated for the Puerto Rico electric uh, system and Luma and Quanta Services and at Coconetian Utilities are after those funds. It's over nine billion, with a B, dollars that Luma would be controlling and profiting from and, and their, its affiliates, its parent companies, um, in doing a rebuild of the 20th century centralized grid that we have that is so vulnerable to hurricanes. Um, so it, civil society groups that I work with are totally opposed to handing over those funds to Luma. And we have a proposal called Queremos Sol, We Want Sun, which is decentralized, decarbonized, um, and more democratized, as Professor Catalina Onis would, would, de Onis would say. Um, and also decolonized, by the way, because we, don't, we, we, we are trying to not depend on fossil fuel imports. Um, and the Luma contract stands in the way of that kind of electric system that civil society is asking for in Puerto Rico. And the uh, Puerto Rico already had established an energy policy which mandated that 40 percent of its electricity must come from renewables resources by 2025 and 100 percent by 2050. So how does all of this, uh, uh, all of this uh, putting Luma in charge of the grid, uh, uh, how does that dovetail with this policy, or, or does it not? It does not. Um, it's, it's, Luma is the main impediment. We were, we've been at hearings where Luma representatives say that the FEMA funds can't be used for renewable or rooftop solar, as we're proposing, which is totally wrong, and they were called out on that, and, and now are trying to say that they do uh, favor renewables, but it's, it's not true. We know, we know their true intention is to rebuild a centralized transmission system that connects the fossil-fired plants in southern Puerto Rico, environmental justice communities in Salinas, Guayama, um, Guayanilla, Peñuelas, that they want to connect those plants. Luma's plan is to harden, what they call harden, the transmission system that connects those plants to the San Juan metro area and continue the centralized fossil-fired system. Ruth, you are on the um, uh, White House Advisory Council. Um, you're saying if FEMA directs rebuilding money to fossil fuel instead of renewable, you're weighing quitting, and you're there trying. You're like a journalist in the U.S. Pavilion trying to talk to U.S. officials. Yes. Um, I, I think that FEMA has, and, and the Biden administration has a it, one of its biggest tests right at the beginning here of its administration to um, put the money where its promises are. Um, and Puerto Rico is a great case. In the case of Puerto Rico, as I mentioned, FEMA has allocated already that's nine, over $9 billion, and it could be a lot more, um, for the electric system work. And it's allocated to the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority. And what FEMA needs to do is to put into effect, apply its um, executive order to tackle the climate crisis, um, the president's executive order tackling the climate crisis and centering environmental justice. And um, there, there's no impediment in terms of re Republican opposition here, nothing to prevent FEMA from doing that. And so we think that this is a, a great test for the Biden administration to show that it indeed is very serious about tackling the climate crisis. Ruth Santiago, I want to thank you for being with us. Longtime lawyer, environmental justice advocate in Puerto Rico, member of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, attending COP26. Coming up, we speak to the leading Filipina youth climate activist, Mitzi Tan, in 30 seconds. Sardin ang digmaan 
of War by Musi Kang Bayan. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Climate justice activists are preparing for a major march and rally in Glasgow Saturday, calling on world leaders to do more to address the climate emergency. Speakers will include some of the most prominent youth climate activists, including Greta Thunberg of Sweden, Vanessa Nakate of Uganda, and our next guest, Mitzi Tan of the Philippines. Last Friday, she rallied outside the offices of Standard Chartered Bank in London to protest financial institutions funding fossil fuel extraction. The Philippines is one of the most climate vulnerable countries in the world to the climate crisis, and Standard Chartered Bank is fueling most of that destruction in our country. They are the biggest international bank that is funding the most fossil fuel companies in my country, the Philippines, which is ravaged by typhoons year after year. They've brought destruction to our doorstep, so we're here at their doorstep to demand for justice and to demand them to defund climate chaos. Mitzi Janelle Tan joins us now in Glasgow, international spokesperson of Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines and organizer of Fridays for Future and Fridays for Future Most Affected Peoples and Areas. Um, the Philippines, one of the most vulnerable countries in the world to the climate crisis. What demands are you making here, Mitzi, of the world leaders? I think my demands are the same as everyone's demands, really. It's very clear and simple. We have to stop funding our destruction. We have to stop picking the fossil fuel industry over people's lives. And we need to have those drastic carbon dioxide emission cuts with actual plans and steps how to get there. And we need reparations from the global north to the global south so that the global south can adapt and manage the loss and damages that we've already experienced. And Mitzi, could you provide a little more detail about how Standard Chartered Bank uh, is uh, playing such a key role in the Philippines in uh, uh, fossil fuel development? So Standard Chartered Bank is the international bank that has the largest investments in fossil fuel companies in the Philippines. And these fossil fuel companies are not only putting up these coal-fired power plants, but they're also displacing people's lives, threatening people's livelihoods. Um, some Campaigners who have campaigned against some coal-fired power plants by this company have had hired goons go to their homes and have received death threats. So you're really seeing how Standard Chartered Bank, although their slogan is here for good, isn't actually here for good because these are the people and the companies that they're supporting, ones that are literally killing people in the Philippines today. And we're also seeing how Standard Chartered Bank today is trying to pose itself as a leader in climate finance and wants to push the idea of carbon offsetting, when really that's just an excuse so that Global North countries and multinational companies can keep um, emitting and destroying our planet. And several years ago, you were studying mathematics at the University of the Philippines, as I understand it, when you met members of the Lumad indigenous group of the Philippines. Could you talk about their battle uh, in terms of extractive industries and how that shaped your view of uh, the fight for climate justice? The reason why I became a climate activist was because of that interaction with the Lumad indigenous peoples. He was telling us about how they were being harassed and displaced and killed and militarized. And then ever so simply, he shrugged and chuckled and said, that's why we have no choice but to fight back. And that short phrase changed my life and my worldview because I realized that I had this privilege to quote unquote choose to be an activist. But really at this point, none of us have a choice. We all have to join the struggle of the most marginalized and of the environmental defenders for our planet, for our common liberation. And when we realize this, when we realize that we're not doing this alone, it's also something that really helps shape how you approach the climate justice movement, because then you remember that it always has to be a collective effort. It always has to be a community effort. And that's really what we're doing here. We're building a world together. Mitzi Tan, many have called this cop the COP26, the whitest and the most privileged COP to date, um, because of issues of access for activists in the global south when it comes to vaccines, visas, travel finances. Um, can you talk about how that has shaped the discussion? Um, and also your forming of MAPA, um, uh, the most affected peoples and areas group within Fridays for Future, the priorities of your group? 
So it's not just this UN Climate Summit that's white and global north centric. It's always been every single um, UN Climate Summit because if you had the people most marginalized at these tables, if you had the people who are most impacted at these tables deciding, we wouldn't be in the climate crisis that we are in today. And at this UN Climate Summit, again, we're seeing that even if there are some young people here, we're still not being listened to. Because if we were actually being listened to, then we would be seeing action. But again, we're just hearing empty words and empty promises. And that's why MAPA, which is most affected peoples and areas, is here to really make sure that the voices of the most affected people and areas are amplified and centered. Because that's how we impress upon people that the climate crisis is already here. It's not a problem of a future. It's a problem of today. It's happening today. And we have to remember that the system that we have that's so obsessed really with profit and using colonialism and imperialism and capitalism to exploit people's lives, especially people of color, that is the system that we have that has brought us to the climate crisis. And exactly that is what MAPA is trying to change. We're trying to make sure that we have a world where no one is left behind. And I wanted to ask you, the U.S., of course, is, is the world's largest historical e emitter of climate pollution. Uh, how, how do you—what's your message to President Biden? Uh, because, obviously, he keeps talking about climate change as an existential crisis, but in terms of actual delivery of, uh, of uh, reform by the United States, is so lacking. Joe Biden, you said that you were a climate president, but you have done nothing but disappoint us. If you really cared, if you really thought that the climate crisis was an existential problem, then we would be seeing drastic emission cuts, not at this rate that you're doing now, because all the pledges even aren't even enough at this point, considering what the U.S. has already done. And then you remember everything else the U.S. is doing with its military, which is one of its, the biggest, world's biggest polluters and of emissions also, with um, the destruction of our environment with the multinational companies that's destroying forests and displacing indigenous peoples in our countries. There's a lot of things that the U.S. needs to start doing, and one of them is the drastic carbon dioxide emission cuts. The second one would be to really ramp up the climate reparations, not in the form of loans, but in the form of grants to countries in the global south, and then even more. The U.S. has so much to do and hasn't even started. Finally, your Twitter handle includes the hashtag uproot the system. What does uprooting the system mean to you, Mitzi? That's actually a narrative of Fridays for Future in our climate strikes the past last, the, the one in September, in October, and the one that's coming up on November 5th at the youth climate strike here at Glasgow. Uproot the system means that we are looking at the roots of the climate crisis. How did we even get here? Because it's not just an environmental problem. It's not just a problem about carbon dioxide emissions. At its core, it's a systemic problem that impacts people. It's a system that has caused not just the climate crisis, but also all the other socioeconomic crises like um, racism and ableism and sexism and class inequality. And all of these socioeconomic crises, they amplify the climate crisis and are amplified by the climate crisis. We so want the to only thank way you, to solve the climate crisis is to, so to uproot the system. Mitzi Tan, thank you so much for being with us, spokesperson of Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez in Glasgow and the U.S.